It's the bombastic symphony, the exaggerated dramatic angles. It's the fact that Ryuk is going through withdrawals from fucking apples in the middle of the room. And then there's the dialogue, the fucking ridiculously over the top dialogue. I'm gonna show you L. Welcome back, everyone. Episode 8. Glare. So the episode starts off with Akira Task Force reviewing footage from the deaths of the FBI agents who were working in Japan. It's clear that any semblance of excitement has tapered off as they all look pretty exhausted. Everyone except for Ryuzaki. But then, given the bags under his eyes, one could argue that he's always exhausted. Thank goodness for ice cream, right? Something worth noting about this scene is the fact that they're all engaging in conversation, but it's clear that they're not really paying all that much attention. And it's not like they don't care or anything, it's just more so the fact that they're likely not used to working under these kinds of conditions. I mean, they did just lose about 90% of their team, if not more. That's a lot of slack that they've got to pick up. Hell, just look at all the tapes they need to get through. These guys are putting in the work, that's for sure. Anyway, they're currently looking into Ray Penberg's death when Ryuzaki says, We know that Ray Penberg got on the train and then an hour and a half later he got off and died on the platform, but the Yamanote line only takes an hour to complete its circuit. That's actually an insane catch because why do you just know off the top of your head how long it takes for that train to complete a circuit? But honestly, that's neither here nor there. The truly important catch is when Ryuzaki points out the envelope. You all remember the one from episode 5 that Light handed to Ray so that he could write down all of the names? Ryuzaki noticed that he boarded with it, but then left without it, something the others fail to notice. Again, kind of conveying to us the difference between Ryuzaki and the others. I mean, honestly, while they'll all eventually prove to be useful in their own right, as it stands, they're kind of irrelevant, aside from their access to certain things. What I mean by that is, I imagine Ryuzaki wouldn't have been able to get his hands on these tapes without their clearance. However, now that he does have them, these guys aren't really doing much to add to the investigation, at least not from what we've seen from their interactions thus far. One more thing to note here before we switch scenes, Ryuzaki noticed is that as Ray laid there dying, he seemed to make a concerted effort to turn around and look back into the train. Wouldn't it be interesting if Kira was on that train? It's an interesting hypothesis, the idea that Kira would be on the train, but as Ryuzaki himself says, There's no reason for Kira to come to the scene of his own crime when he can kill from a distance. It does seem like a bit of a reach for Ryuzaki to just come up with this idea that Kira was on the train on his own, honestly. I mean, Ray could have been turning around for any number of reasons, one of which could have just been sheer panic at the fact that he was actively dying. And without any sort of knowledge of the Death Note and how it works, it just feels like kind of a stretch to assume that Kira was in the vicinity of this specific agent when he died. I'm not saying he's wrong, obviously he's not, but are we saying that none of the other agents did anything noteworthy during their last moments alive? Back in the Yagami household, we see that Ryuk is a little irritated. What's going on with you, Light? What are you trying to prove? I don't see the point in writing these names weeks in advance. I've never seen the Death Note used like this. What's interesting to me is how annoyed Ryuk seems to sound as if Light being efficient hasn't been a staple of his character since they met. But even more so than that, what does it matter to Ryuk that Light uses the notebook like this? Does it make it less entertaining? I mean, I could definitely see that being a thing, but then even if he did spread it out, I don't really know how much that would affect the level of excitement for Ryuk. I guess the more efficient Light is, the less opportunities there are for shit like the bus jacking or what he did with Ray on the train or that situation with Naomi. Regardless, Light responds by saying, Consider it insurance. Before explaining that if anything were to happen to him, say, if he were hospitalized, he'd be able to cover his ass for a few weeks. Light then poses a question to Ryuk regarding how far out he can set dates for murders, to which Ryuk responds by saying that it should be possible to set it out as far as you want, assuming the person's life expectancy isn't before that time. The reason I bring this up is because, by that logic, you could never extend your life by using the death note. For example, if I wanted to write that I would die at the age of 100 in my sleep, that wouldn't work if my life expectancy expectancy said I was supposed to die from a, uh, a crushed pelvis from some hardcore snoo snoo. Yes! Oh, thank you, Lord in heaven. I really can't count on you, can I? You got that right. Again, conveying to us that Ryuk is unreliable. However, in this instance, it makes a lot of sense. The scene began with him saying that he's never seen the notebook used like that, and why would he? He stated on more than one occasion that Shinigami just don't operate like that. So him not having the answers? Well, that makes sense. We head back to the de facto headquarters for the team and find that they're getting a call on their tip line. Ray Pember's fiance, Naomi Misora. <gasps> so it's her. 
She's from the Los Angeles BB murder case. Well, apparently she's been missing since the day after her fiance died. So obviously this is important because it's yet another reason to look into Ray Pinber, given the fact that she was engaged to him. And by looking further into Ray Pinber, that means looking further into the people that he was investigating, which of course leads directly to light. However, another thing worth noting about this is the fact that Ryuzaki actually remembers her. I have to imagine he's worked on dozens, if not hundreds of cases. And the fact that he instantly remembered her, even though he's never met her in person says a lot about the lasting effect she had on him. She said it herself that she figured that he might remember her and she was right. I'm sure that anyone in her situation would be pretty depressed. Was it? Suicide. No. If anything, it's more likely she'd be trying to catch Kira. Ryuzaki continues this train of thought, coming up with the idea that perhaps she was taken out by Kira. And honestly, Light kind of fucked himself on that, specifically because he added that she would commit suicide in a place where she'd never be found. If she had, say, done it at home, then it would be clear what happened. And since no one knows that he can kill in ways other than a heart attack, then they'd have to take it at face value. But because they'll never find a body, it leaves it open for interpretation, and Ryuzaki Yuzaki's interpretation leads to him saying, Everyone, at this point I'd like to focus our investigation on only those people who Ray Pember was tailing. And there you have it. Very well, who are these two individuals he was investigating? Oof, <laughs> I don't know if you really want to know the answer to that one, Chief. Detective Superintendent Yagami and their <gasps> families. At this stage I'd like to place wiretaps and surveillance cameras in both households. Back in the Yagami household, as if aware of what was being said amongst the Kira task force, we see Light scrubbing his computer of any evidence. I have to make sure there's no evidence left on this computer, just in case someone goes through it. We then get this funny little line. It seems like you're pretty skilled with your hands. I bet you're pretty popular with the girls, aren't you? Which is... Uh, okay, but I suppose what's even more interesting is Light's response, as he claims that skills have very little to do with it. It's your looks that count. And this harkens back to another running theme, if, if you could even call it that. I guess it's more so just a characteristic of his personality, wherein he's very much aware of how attractive he is. I am aware of the effect I have on women. Essentially, Light's a bit of a fuckboy, and the series supports that idea. Remember that date to Spaceland in episode 4? Before calling the girl he settled on going with, he mentioned to Ryuk that he had a couple of options available to him. Furthermore, as far back as episode 1, we saw those two girls giggling as he walked by, implying they thought he was cute. The show has made it clear that Light is an attractive fellow, and he's more than aware of this, and has been, and will continue to, use this to his advantage. Anyway, after saying that, he follows it up by telling Ryuk, I'm guessing you're not that popular, are you? Huh? Anyway, back at HQ. Surveillance cameras? I don't see how you could even consider this. We'd all lose our jobs. You told me you'd be willing to risk your lives for this investigation, but you wouldn't risk your jobs? He has a point. A damn good point at that. What does it matter if you lose your job if it means taking down Kitta? What are we even doing here if you keeping your job is somehow more important than taking down the biggest mass murderer in modern history? I like the fact that there's an edge to Ryuzaki's voice when he says it too. Like, are you fucking kidding me right now? Like the idea that they would care more about keeping their jobs than taking down Kitta sounds so ridiculous that he can't even mask his irritation. It's nice. And I also like that they don't have shit to say to that because when presented in such a way, it really does seem stupid that they put job security over trying to literally protect the people of the world, especially considering the fact that they were willing to put their lives on the line. It seems illogical. And yet, in saying that, I can also understand why their immediate response would be like that. This is all brand new territory for them. Up until a few weeks ago, or maybe months now, things were normal. And now they're so far removed from any semblance of normalcy that they're about to agree to spy on their fellow officers and their families. It's understandable that they'd have these feelings. So I can see both sides of it and I feel like it speaks to how well written the show is that I can clearly see and understand both sides of this particular argument. Anyway, the chief who is visibly upset by this revelation asks what the likelihood of Kira being in either one of those households is. To which Rizaki says that he believes that there's roughly a 5% chance that Kira might be in one of the homes. Matsuda is quick to still shut the idea down which aligns with his more, uh, innocent worldview, kind of what I was alluding to in episode 6 with his suggestion of media restrictions. However, the chief gives his best Batfleck impression as he says, Even if there's only a 1% chance, we simply can't afford to ignore it. But anyway, while he agrees to the cameras, he makes it clear that he's not happy about it. I don't have to tell you how offended I am. Having said that, just go ahead with it. He even goes beyond plus Ultra, and tells him that he wants cameras everywhere, bathrooms included, so that there can be no doubt that his family is innocent. Even though, you know, they're not, but anyway. After telling this to Ryuzaki, Matsuda and Aizawa chime in, telling him that he ought to consider his wife and daughter, and that's when he 
kind of fucking loses it. There is no point in doing any of this if we can't be thorough. Now I suggest you keep quiet. And yeah, that pretty much shuts them up. It's really a shitty situation. And the chief, to his credit, pretty much immediately apologizes for the outburst. Rizaki then, as a courtesy to the chief, tells everyone that only he and the chief will be looking into his family, while everyone else will focus on monitoring the other officer's family. And I guess it does say a lot that Rizaki is willing to let the chief look in on his own family. I feel like it speaks to Rizaki feeling confident that the chief would put his duty as an officer over that of loyalty to his family. Which, fucking hell, that's a pretty big thing, I feel. But, I mean, it does align with who we know the chief to be. The scene ends with Rizaki and Watari discussing preparations, with the final shot being the chief standing by himself in the corner, both his fists clenched in frustration. Which, again, is understandable, because this adds an entirely new dynamic to things. He now has to lie to his family. It's one thing to keep secrets from them regarding his work, but to be straight up monitoring their actions without giving them a heads up, that's, well, that's rough. The scene transitions to a new day and we see Light coming home from school. He tries opening the front door and finds that it's locked, which kind of throws him off. He then unlocks the door and enters the home and we get a change in perspective as we view him through a camera, one of the many cameras that have been installed in the home. And while not necessarily aware of the cameras themselves, the moment Light turns the lever to his bedroom door, he realizes that something's going on. Also important to note, as he enters his room, we see a small piece of paper fall on the ground. Once he's in his room, Ryuk immediately begins speaking to him, but Light doesn't respond. However, I do want to point out something that Ryuk says that really, uh, kind of threw me off. I don't think anyone else is in the house right now. Do you want to play some video games? Oh, uh, <laughs> what? So, apparently these guys play video games? Which is the fuck i mean like what games would they even play like imagine them just going at it in some fucking street fighter or something or something random like 2k uh, or whatever year this came out or maybe we just like to watch him play animal crossing or something regardless that's a wild thing to just casually throw in there with just no additional explanation because again the fuck anyway ryu continues trying to get light's attention to no avail because obviously light is aware that someone might currently be watching him anyway light only spends a couple of minutes in his room before leaving again making sure to put the small slip of paper back as he shuts his door it's then that we see that the chief and ryuzaki are currently watching him the chief comments on his behavior saying i never knew he went to such great lengths what could he be hiding in there that he doesn't want anyone else to see? To which L responds by saying that it's not super uncommon, claiming that he also did strange things as a kid. The scene transitions back to Light and Ryuk as they're walking down a random street. Ryuk is still trying to get Light's attention to no avail, until finally Light responds by saying that he believes his room has been bugged, with wiretaps, cameras, or maybe both. He then goes on to explain why he's sure that someone was in his room, both because of how his door handle works, as well as because of a piece of lead he keeps on the hinge that breaks when the door is open. Anyway, Light and Ryuk stop by a bookstore and pick something up, and then head back home. On the way home, Light tells Ryuk, By the way, Ryuk, what about your apples? Which leads to an interesting slash comedic interaction between the two. Ryu comments on how if he were to pick up an apple, it would look like it's floating before he actually eats it. And Light, being well aware of the fact that Ryu does not need food in order to survive, tells him that he'll either have to stop eating apples or help him find all the cameras and wiretaps. And the reason it's so comedic is because, well, I'll, I'll let Ryu tell it. I never told you this, but apples are to me what cigarettes and alcohol are to humans. I even get withdrawal symptoms. My body gets all twisted. I do handstands. It's not pretty. I don't need to see that. But essentially, by using Ryuk's addiction to his favor, Light is able to convince him to search his room for any cameras and wiretaps, which was a smart way of handling it. I don't really have much to say on it other than it uses what's been established since episode one to set up a situation wherein Light can use that information to his favor. All right, everybody, welcome back to How to Read. First up, we have a person can shorten his or her own life by using the note. Self-explanatory, moving on. Second one is, the human who becomes the owner of the Death Note can, in exchange for half of his or her remaining life, get the eyeballs of the God of Death which will enable him or her to see a human's name and remaining lifetime when looking through them. And this one is one we've already been over, so yeah. Things pick back up later that night with Light looking at, uh, uh, porn. Anyway, as Light looks at porn, his father and Rizaki look at him, and, uh, don't like the way that sounds. Anyway, for some weird reason, Light's dad has an issue with the fact that he's watching porn, as if that's not super common for young men. It's really odd how much he seems to actually care about that. But Rizaki does make a good point in saying, It seems contrived. And he's right, it honestly just seems weird. Anyway, the conversation between Rizaki and the chief is starting to get a little spicy, with the chief getting upset at some of Rizaki's comments, ultimately ending in him blatantly 
asking. Hey, that's my son you're talking about. Are you honestly telling me that you suspect him? I do suspect him. Gotta respect the honesty, right? Meanwhile, back in Light's room, we see Ryuk has found a camera, to which Light tells himself, Even if this is the Kira case, I didn't think the Japanese police would ever go this far. And why not, exactly? I mean, you've presented them with an unprecedented threat. It's not like you're playing by the rules. Why would you just automatically expect them to, you know? I mean, maybe at first, but it's been weeks, months, and they've gotten practically nowhere. At some point, they're going to have to step their game up. Perhaps it's because he knows his father well enough to know that he wouldn't advocate for something like this. Anyway, Light puts his porn away and heads downstairs for dinner, where his younger sister is watching a show or a movie headlined by someone named Hideki Ryuga. That'll be somewhat important later. We switch back to HQ, where Ryuzaki contacts Watsuri and tells him to send out their message regarding what was discussed back in episode 6, about the 1500 investigators being sent to Japan. After hearing the news, Light immediately sees through the farce and makes it known by saying, If they're gonna send all these people here to investigate, shouldn't they keep it a secret? This is nothing more than a desperate attempt to shock Kira. I wouldn't be surprised if Kira sees right through this. So that was an interesting way to approach that. I mean, it's not anything that would outright expose him, but it just feels very weird that he's aware that he's being watched and is still talking shit, essentially talking shit directly to Ryuzaki. Like the whole point is to make himself seem less suspicious and saying something like that just feels kind of counterintuitive. Like he's taunting Ryuzaki and that just doesn't seem very smart. If anything, it seems childish as fuck. And it even gets a slight chuckle out of Ryuzaki who calls him clever. But then you have the chief over there and you can just tell by his body language that he wished Light hadn't said that. And I completely understand why. If Ryuzaki was suspicious before, I would argue that that comment would have only stoked those flames. Fucking Light, man. Anyway, Light heads upstairs to his room where an exhausted Ryuk is waiting on him. Ryuk then goes on to explain the locations of all of the cameras and wiretaps, of which there are uh, a lot, to put it mildly. There sure are a lot of cameras in this room. I counted 64 in total. Like I said, a lot. How many cameras you got? A lot. But something even more interesting than the amount is what Ryuk says afterwards. I guess whoever put them here expected you to at least find some of them. And is that true? I mean, obviously there's no way to confirm it or not, but it's weird to think about because why would they want him to find a camera? to gauge his reaction to finding it, but then what do you have to gain from that? I feel like it's maybe just the rantings of an exhausted Shinigami, but still, 64 is a lot. Anyway, then we get this weird line from Light. It has to be L. He had no qualms about putting a death row inmate in his place when he declared war on me. It's pretty clear he doesn't know any limits. Bro, what? Like seriously, what? You're saying that he doesn't know any limits even though you killed the person he put on TV in his place while thinking it was him. Like, what? <laughs> I'll be the first to admit that it was crazy of Ryuzaki to have done something like that, but Bro, you're the reason he did it. He figured you might do something crazy, and then you did something crazy. Plus, the idea that you're saying that he's declaring war on you when you fired the first, uh, uh, signature? You know what I mean. It's just, it's insane. That's the fucking light is insane. Anyway, in knowing where all of the cameras are, he's decided to put his plan in motion. And, well, <laughs> it's a doozy. A simple one, really, but also... Anything but. So the bag of chips that I mentioned earlier contains within it a miniature television. Not entirely sure when he put it in there. It was probably while he was out running errands or something. Maybe at the same time he bought that magazine. However, his plan is to make himself look as innocent as possible. Uh, I mean, not counting the comments he made earlier at dinner. Therefore, he needs to kill criminals while making it appear as though he doesn't have access to any information about them. So therein comes the mini TV that he hid in this bag. He intends on using it, coupled with a piece of the notebook that he has taped inside of the bag, to write down criminals' names as they appear on TV. It's relatively simple, and honestly, if you're looking at it from the perspective of Ryuzaki and the Chief, it's wholly uninteresting. However, what makes this scene so epic or iconic, infamous, whatever you want to call it, is how it's portrayed from Light's perspective. Because <laughs> it's, it's fucking nuts. It's the bombastic symphony, the exaggerated dramatic angles, which usually would accompany an epic fight scene. It's the fact that Ryuk is going through withdrawals from fucking apples in the middle of the room. And then there's the dialogue, the fucking ridiculously over the top dialogue. I'm gonna show you L. Solve equations with my right hand and write names with my left. I'll take a potato chip and eat it. It's all so wonderfully absurd and silly and just absolutely cool as shit. And Rizaki and the Chief don't get to experience any of it because, again, to them, it just looks like 
this. After this, we switch back to the chief and Rizaki as Watsuri informs them that two criminals who were just broadcasted on the news had been killed. Rizaki then speaks about how no one in the Yagani household had access to this information while it was being reported on the news. This causes the chief to immediately say, You said it yourself. That means my family has been cleared. And I just want to stop for a second and point out how he's almost... I don't know, pleading to Ryuzaki to accept that his family is innocent. Which makes sense, the sooner he can clear their name, the better, but yeah, uh, <laughs> Ryuzaki's not going for that. In fact, according to him, I know it's only the first day after the cameras were installed, but the Yagami household seems almost too innocent to me. And it's the face that he makes right after this almost unabashed intrigue in what's going on. It seems, uh, well, very childlike, like he's been presented with a puzzle that he wants to make sense of. Where the chief is frustrated and exhausted, Ryuzaki's eyes are wide open and he looks almost excited about the situation. But to speak more on this for a moment, it's wild to think that Light did this in order to prove his innocence and all it really did was put more of a target on his back. It's like every decision he makes ends up being scrutinized even more. It's just kind of funny that all of this is supposed to be helping him clear his name and all it's really doing is making him appear all the more guilty. Anyway, the episode ends with Light waking up the following morning and throwing away the bag of chips with the mini TV still inside. The final shot is of Light looking down at the trash compactor as it crushes any evidence of what transpired. And roll credits. That's it for this time. If you liked this video, then drop a like. If you really liked it, consider subscribing. And just for shits and giggles, drop a comment about what video games y'all think these two are playing in their free times. I'm genuinely curious. Anyway, it's been real, y'all. Catch you next week when we take a look at episode nine, Encounter. Until then, peace.